and loud mic. Excellent. All right. Welcome, everyone. On behalf of the U.S. Agency for International Development and the Feed the Future Initiative, I would like to welcome you to today's seminar on Health, Resilience, and Sustainable Poverty Escapes. This seminar is a joint production of AgriLinks, MicroLinks, and the USAID Center for Resilience. So we've got a lot of players coming together to hold this discussion on a cross-cutting issue of health and how it relates to uh, the other sectors. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I am your AgriLinks facilitator. So if you've been to an AgriLinks event before, you've probably uh, seen me up here. And if you have any feedback about AgriLinks events, MarketLinks events, or any of the knowledge sharing experiences at the USAID Bureau for Food Security, I'm happy uh, to answer those questions. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to go over uh, just a few housekeeping issues. Uh, first, for those of us who are joining in person, please silence your cell phones so that we don't interrupt the speakers. Uh, if you're joining us online, you are welcome to not silence your cell phones, if you wish. Um, on that note, we do have a sizable online audience expected today. We actually had about 600 people register for the webinar, which I think is a record number for an AgriLinks or MarketLinks webinar. So that's exciting. We'll, we'll have more people joining us online than we have here in the room. Uh, we will be holding questions and answers until after the presentations, and we'll come pass around a mic uh, to those of you in the room, and we'll alternate questions with the uh, online and in-person audiences. We are also recording this webinar, and if you signed, uh, signed up to attend or signed in on the sheet out there, you will get an email with the recording, the transcript, and some additional recommended resources. All right, I think that's all I've got for... Uh, introductory pieces, so I'm going to introduce our speakers and then uh, pass it off to them. So we will have uh, Tiffany Griffin giving an introduction and framing the work uh, that you'll be hearing about today. And she's with the USAID Bureau for Food Security um, and is the Resilience Measurement, Monitoring, Evaluation, and uh, Analysis, or does that work for the USAID Center for Resilience. We also have Vidya Dewakar who is a mixed methods researcher at the Chronic Poverty Action Network, specializing in gender disaggregated analysis of poverty dynamics, conflict, and education. She'll be next. And then next up will be Andrew Shepard with the Chronic Poverty Action Network. And Andrew has been with CPAN since its inception in 2011, and with ODI, uh, where CPAN is now hosted, since 2002, and he has three decades of work on poverty under his belt. And lastly, we will welcome Lynn Michaelopoulos, who is a consultant with the uh, Center for Resilience at USAID and is providing expertise and technical support related to resilience measurement and analysis, especially as it relates to psychosocial factors. And she is also currently an associate professor at the Columbia School of Social Work. But first, uh, oops, go back to Lynn. Here. Head back here. Uh, first up, we will have Christine Gottschalk, who is the acting director with the USAID Center for Resilience. And she brings over 15 years of experience in international humanitarian and development assistance. And she'll be giving a welcome on behalf of the Center for Resilience. So first up, Christine. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, first, I just want to thank Julie and the whole AgriLinks team um, for hosting this event. It's great that we're setting a record um, <laughs> and have um, over 600 people who are registered for this, this webinar. Um, it really, truly is great to see so much interest <clears throat> in resilience and also in this topic in particular, really looking at health, resilience, and the links with sustainable poverty escapes. USAID is committed to helping to build the resilience of vulnerable communities and to increasing their ability to manage through crises and without compromising their future well-being. Evidence um, like this work by, by ODI has been and continues to be really critical in advancing our understanding of resilience why it matters, and how it is different, and in shaping the vision for the agency. Um, some of you may be aware the proposed USAID redesign um, recognizes that 
resilience is needed to break the cycle of chronic vulnerability, poverty, and hunger. It's needed to reduce the need for recurrent humanitarian assistance and to accelerate progress on the journey to self-reliance. And as a result, it really is being elevated as we look at the future work of the agency. Um, this work that we're going to learn about today uh, by ODI furthers our understanding of health shocks on the household and approaches that we can take to help build resilience. Um, so without further ado, I invite Tiffany to, to start us off so we can get into the, the meat of the discussion. And thanks all and many thanks to, to our speakers today. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to keep talking until someone tells me that my audio isn't working. Um, my name is Tiffany Griffin, and I am the lead for resilience measurement and analysis for the Center for Resilience. Um, thank you to everyone who is attending today's webinar. I'm really excited to convene um, this group to talk about today's work. Um, just as a little bit of background, this work builds off of three pilots on resilience and sustainable poverty escapes that we did a couple years ago in Uganda, Bangladesh, and Ethiopia. And in those pilots, um, a few themes emerged and bubbled up to the top. Uh, so the first is that development progress isn't linear. So there are dynamics. Um, for, for all of the gains that we have with respect to strengthening our development outcomes, um, those gains can easily be uh, lost at macro levels and at a household level. So um, the short version of that is there are dynamics in and around the development outcomes that we care about. Um, Sizable proportions of communities escape poverty, and, and that's good. Um, but these analyses showed that they also um, fall back into poverty at alarming rates. Uh, another big theme that emerged from that initial set of pilot case studies is that shocks, uh, particularly those occurring um, sequentially, so back-to-back -back shocks, and including idiosyncratic shocks, or those shocks that cumulatively affect individual households, uh, really matter for sustaining development gains. And then third, many of the sources of resilience that began to emerge, um, these resilience capacities that help households and communities manage risk in the face of recurrent shocks and covariate shocks also seem to help households escape poverty and stay out of poverty over time. So they have these dual um, advantages, these, these sources of resilience. So these findings have been extremely powerful to date. Um, they've helped uh, countries that do not necessarily face those recurrent crises, um, like recurrent drought or recurrent flooding. They've helped those types of contexts and countries and populations apply resilience thinking and approaches to their context. Um, because of the initial power, because of the power of these initial pilots, we've partnered with ODI to conduct another um, set of case studies in a second set of countries, and they'll be talking about uh, those results today. But in designing this convening to bring our resilience community together to discuss the, the collection of case studies writ large, we decided to focus in on rather than looking at poverty dynamics writ large, we decided to focus in on a theme that kept emerging across these case studies. And that theme is the theme of health. So theoretically, health should intersect with resilience and poverty dynamics in at least three ways, right? Um, uh, first, ill health at the individual, household, and or community level can present as shocks that threaten sustainable poverty escape over time. Um, second, positive health statuses, so including uh, healthy nutrition, 
um, strong health systems, widespread access to affordable health insurance. These act as important sources of resilience or important resilience capacities in the face of shocks and stresses that protect households' um, poverty escapes over time, help them sustain their poverty escapes over time. And then third, health outcomes are in and of themselves development outcomes that need to be protected in the face of shocks and stresses. So today's presentation that Vidya and Andrew and Lynn will guide us through puts some analytics and some analysis to that conceptual and theoretical frame. Um, in today's presentation, you'll hear our colleagues uh, focus in on those first two ways that health resilience and poverty inter intersect, namely um, the importance of health shocks and the importance of health as a resilience capacity with respect to protecting um, poverty alleviation over time. And it's my hope that in addition to yielding important findings in and of themselves, that this work also prompts some of the folks in the audience today to take on analysis of, of that third bucket as well, analyzing uh, health outcome dynamics in the face of shocks and stresses. So with that, uh, thank you again to our ODI colleagues for leading these analyses. Welcome again to all of you um, who are attending today's webinar, and a big thanks to our KDAD, Center for Resilience, and BFS colleagues for organizing this event. Uh, Vidya, over to you. Thank you so much, Corrine. Thank you for that. So, hi everyone, my name is Vidya and I work in the Chronic Poverty Advisory Network. Um, in this presentation, I will first find the slide. I will first begin by providing a bit of context, outlining some methods, um, and providing some background motivation for this set of work that we've been undertaking over the last two to three years, as Kip Tiffany mentioned. And this will then be followed by some synthesized findings across country studies to then contextualize what Andrew Shepard, director of CPAN, will be speaking about, which will be specifically synthesized findings around and policy implications stemming from the health theme of today's presentation. So as Tiffany mentioned, our health and resilience conceptual framework itself, the main focus of today's event, is around um, health, resilience, and sustainable poverty escapes, so specifically viewing health as a shock, but also as a resilience capacity that can then, um, should be nurtured over time in order to sustain poverty escapes. So really quickly, before delving into the synthesis findings across studies, a bit of working backwards to provide some of the key takeaways from this work. Um, and this work has taken place across 11 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia. And some key takeaways which we'll speak to in the coming slides are, for example, around the fact that, as Tiffany noted as well, that sustained escapes and transitory escapes really vary in their prevalence across countries, um, as well that agriculture remains critical in um, sustaining escapes, even amidst decreasing land sizes and incomes. Although it should be noted as well that smallholder farmers, farmers rarely get the level of support that they typically need, which we'll come back to again. Um, as well that adverse gender and other social norms can prolong chronic poverty and even prevent households initially escaping poverty, let alone sustaining escapes over time. And then there's really this conflict climate nexus as well that we've seen across these country studies on a subnational level, which provides a hotbed for impoverishment. And then regarding health, what we see is that health shocks typically in sequence or in combinations as well with other shocks can really contribute to high levels of impoverishment. And in this con context, coping strategies to these health shocks really vary for households in the absence of health insurance. And then, but in spite of these um, very coping strategies, there's also clear policy areas which are identified as quite critical in this study with regards to sustaining poverty escapes. And these include universal health insurance, um, improvements around the quality and coverage of health services, and critical links as well, really pointing to the need for a portfolio response. So that's just a bit of background, but now to set the scene a bit. So as I noted, I work in the Chronic Poverty Advisory Network, which is a network of researchers, policymakers, and practitioners. We're hosted by the Overseas Development Institute in London. And in CPAN, we believe that to get to zero extreme poverty, this requires three types of action. 
So action area number one is tackling chronic poverty. That is typically poverty that is long and persistent, often transmitted intergenerationally from parents to children and so on. But this is not the only action area. Instead, this should be combined with efforts to prevent impoverishment or households falling into poverty. And then as well, once households do escape poverty, ensuring that these escapes are in fact sustained over time. And this was a key message of our last chronic poverty report on, um, on getting to zero poverty. So you can take a look at that if interested. Now, our recent set of studies on sustained poverty escapes that we've undertaken along with USAID here has revealed a relatively consistent set of processes whereby individuals typically begin with a set of endowments and resources, and they use these endowments then to over and livelihood strategies to over time invest in assets. And together, these livelihoods and assets can, can contribute to sustained escapes from poverty, but typically in the presence of critical conversion factors, so factors that convert these assets and livelihood income sources into sustained escapes. And this is really in a capabilities framing, um, capabilities approach. So critical, fa critical conversion factors, then one key one which Andrew will be speaking about is around the health systems and health shocks and so on that can inhibit some of these efforts to sustain escapes. So in undertaking this mixed methods analysis, we've relied both on quantitative and qualitative data sources. So CPAN's hallmark Q-squared approach typically involves merging quantitative analysis of panel data, panel data being data sets, household surveys, which repeatedly survey the same households over time, and thus allow poverty trajectories of these households to be constructed. And what we do is we undertake econometric analysis of this panel data to really understand the correlates of these various poverty trajectories. And then we complement this panel data analysis with qualitative fieldwork in a subset of geographies um, within a country. And within the qualitative fieldwork, this comprises key informant interviews with policymakers, uh, researchers, uh, NGOs, and so on, a range of stakeholders at the national and community levels. And we complement this as well with focus group discussions with poor men and women. And then really the brunt of the qualitative approach comes through uh, an intensive life history interview process, which interviews, household, which interviews men and women in, on our different poverty trajectories of interest to really understand the processes and pathways through which households are able to escape poverty and subsequently remain out. So together what this Q-squared approach does is that it really allows you to assess both correlates, drivers, magnitudes of these correlates, of these poverty um, drivers associated with poverty trajectories, but through the life history work and so forth, really understand the processes and pathways as well um, across different levels of analysis, which is then really informative of policy gaps, policy options, as well as evaluations where these are structured into survey data. So. On this process of getting to zero poverty, um, what this graph shows is that there are various poverty dynamics in play. So for example, this is using panel data across the countries we've explored. So in Niger, Malawi, Tanzania, Rwanda, um, rural Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Philippines, and Nepal. Um, and what we really see across countries is that chronic poverty remains significant, especially so in Ethiopia. This is the yellow bar. And this is where risks remain high, even in spite of the PSNP. Um, chronic poverty is less so prevalent, according to this diagram, in Tanzania. But this is largely an artifact of, a, of an effectively low poverty national poverty line. And also what we see from this series of um, poverty dynamics is that transitory escapes are also significant. So in other words, escapes not being converted into sustained escapes. Transitory escapes here is where a household begins poor, then escapes poverty, but subsequently falls back into poverty. And this is especially prevalent in Africa. In contrast, sustained escapes are more so prevalent in Bangladesh and Cambodia, both countries where a relatively significant degree of labor-intensive manufacturing has been taking place and economic transformation accompanying this. So today, as noted, I'll be presenting some key findings um, across country contexts, and then Andrew will really hone in on the health findings across country studies and the policy implications from that.
So as noted earlier, um, sorry, as noted earlier, our research explored the endowments, resources, assets, and conversion factors um, which can contribute to or prevent sustained escape. So I'll very quickly be focusing on some key findings in each area. So with regards to sustained escapes, for example, a key finding around endowments and resources is that, as noted earlier from the key takeaway slide, is that agriculture continues to be important in sustaining escapes, and this is even so where land holdings have become smaller and focused on food farming. So we see this in the graph on the left, for example, in rural Kenya in terms of land holdings which are even lower amongst the chronic poor, and also relatedly in a different country context in Cambodia where the share of income from crops and livestock as well are, remains significant. However, in the policy scene, what you see is that these farmers typically get very little external support even though there are critical interventions that can make a big difference. So here there's really a need for state support to smallholder agriculture, as well as consideration for agricultural workers in irrigation, um, integration of livestock, value chain developments, and so on. Uh, but more typically what we've seen across studies is that for agriculture to contribute to sustained escapes, this typically involves some level of diversification within agriculture, so within crops, um, livestock, upgrading livestock from small ruminants to bigger cattle and so on, but then also diversification from agriculture, but both of course have risks. So for example, around um, diversification from agriculture into non-farm activities, there's risks around capital and um, around acquiring sufficient capital for businesses, around um, credit and so on. But then also alongside this rural non-farm economy, there's also a rising importance across studies of migration. Um, this is typically combined with skill acquisition, with um, including around business development. Um, and this skill acquisition and migration strategies, that, uh, skills can then be often applied upon once migrants return to the home countries. This is seen in Kenya, Niger, Cambodia, to name a few. But then, of course, even where migration can begin as a distress strategy, what's quite promising is that over time, and in some cases, it can also convert into a strategic choice by many households. And here, remittances have also been quite critical across countries, both in as a key input, but at the same time, it can be at a survival level as well. So there's always these trade-offs. There's always there's no necessarily one magic bullet um, for sustaining an escape. And ultimately, then, yes, this, these livelihood strategies can contribute to sustained escapes, but there's also some, typically a level of beneficial social inclusion that can really aid this through an enabling context. Yet what you see across countries is varying levels of adverse social norms, discrimination of marginalized groups that can oftentimes prolong chronic poverty. So with regards to social exclusion, for example, typical groups, um, social exclusion, for example, is often higher in, for women, but also minority ethnic groups, those in remote regions, as we see in Nepal here in our graph, um, where chronic poverty was much higher amongst disadvantaged groups in the far west. And as Keta in one of our life history interviewees noted, this was also linked to one's chronic poverty status, but also low economic condition, poor economic conditions. So this is um, partly, uh, partly a minority group, minority ethnic group story, but it's also one highly also related to gender-based norms and so on. So relatedly, there's across countries, we see a repeated denial of women's access to property, which can impoverish um, women headed households, also more commonly facing theft, um, oftentimes even of their farm and business assets, even from relatives. But instead, on the policy side, you see that statutory and customary laws as well do not provide really adequate protection for widowed, divorced, and separated women, um, which of course then is quite a politically contested issue, especially in patriarchal societies. So on the flip side, though, this is quite a negative picture that I'm painting, but it should be noted on the flip side across studies, in spite of these constraining uh, environments, we see women repeatedly exerting agency and really through the importance of collaborative social relationships, often spousal relationships between, um, but also more broadly across family-based networks, which, which can then contribute to sustained escapes. But ultimately, even with social inclusion, even with this degree of pro-porous growth from below, what we see is that disasters and shocks can really reverse the gains around poverty reduction and sustained escapes. And typically, these um, 
we've seen across studies, for example, a large direct impact of disasters on preventing sustained escapes, but then also indirect impacts such as of drought and its effect of, on conflict um, as manifest through worsening pastoral farmer conflicts in the Sahel and Niger, but also in Kenya and in Tanzania here in our life history diagram where Taboo, who was already chronically poor, then lost her farm, she lost her crops, and she lost her home following conflicts to the extent that she ultimately had to return home to living with her birth family assetless. And also it should be noted that environmental shocks interacts, yes, as noted just now, with conflict in very complex ways, which if you consider this graph, what this graph shows is households which became impoverished or re-impoverished over time, and it compares this with the share of households which sustained poverty escape. So it's a ratio of these two figures. And what we see here is that those with highly negative ratios, highly high rates of impoverishment and transitory escapes are also seen in places with a strong disaster conflict nexus and inadequate pro-porous growth initiatives. So finally, that's some of the research findings writ large. And of course, then these indicate important policy directions. So some big picture takeaways, if you'll remember from the original slide, is that one, sustained escapes, yes, they vary in prevalence, but they're typically produced by combinations of factors. So you see diversification within farming, where land resources are not too small, and also to rural non-farming economic activities. This is also supported by financial services, by education, specifically secondary education. Um, and as well, the gendered aspects where female-headed households still manage to sustain escapes, um, oftentimes supported by strong women's financial inclusion and related micro-business support in the short term, but with needed long-term interventions as well around um, inheritance and land tenure reform. So this combinations of factors then really points to the need to avoid this siloization, especially with regards to building resilience and in the road towards zero poverty through these sustainable poverty escapes. So relatedly then, this is with regards to sustaining escapes, but at the same time, policies need to address major reasons for transitory escapes from poverty. And here is really where health insurance is one, is one critical area in combating, um, in combating a, a major source of impoverishment, which Andrew will go on to speak about. And then beyond this as well, there's a need to really um, add in negative, neglected policy areas, which really require a renewed focus with, of course, context specificities. So for example, agriculture, especially irrigation, remains quite neglected as a policy area in Africa. Same for livestock, which is really important um, in sustaining escapes, but it's also neglected and its risks are relatively less adequately managed. Um, and there's also a need to support the rural non-farm sector more generally, as well as the informal sector within that. So then, with regards to this enabling environment, with regards to these critical conversion factors that can promote sustained escapes, what we see across these studies that it's part economic development trajectory, sure, it's part growth from below, but then it's also part progressive social policy change, pr part progressive social change as seen through beneficial social inclusion, and it's also part policies to promote sustained escapes. So on this note, while we've seen so far that converting transitory escapes into sustained escapes and preventing impoverishment is key to building resilience, as mentioned, there are many sources of this downward mobility and impoverishment, of which ill health is a major one. Andrew Shepard will now address this issue. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much, Vidya, for giving us uh, an insight into the, the general findings of this research. And as Vidya said, I'm going to focus now a little bit on health. Uh, can, if, if I don't turn the slides over in the right time, just, just give me a shout, would you? Because sometimes I forget. So we're, as you can gather, we're poverty analysts. We're not health professionals. Um, but we've been looking at health from a poverty uh, angle. And we hope that uh, what we have to say has some use for health professionals. So those of you who are health professionals in the room, we're not trying to substitute for you in any way. Um, some of the health-specific findings from the research. Firstly, um, there are multiple and sequenced drivers of downwards mobility of impoverishment, as Vidya has mentioned. And here's a case of Mustafa in urban Zinda, Niger. And 
uh, his issues, his uh, shocks, if you like, that he experienced were a business decline. There was reduced demand for the service that he was providing, which was as a wedding photographer. And then it was this was combined with uh, illnesses that his children experienced. Yeah, is that better? Yeah. Uh, illnesses that his children experienced, and uh, I think the death of, of one of those children. And from the panel data in Niger, we know that 16% um, of impoverished household heads in urban areas had a health problem that prevented the head of household from carrying out normal activities for more than a couple of weeks. So urban health issues seem to be uh, quite prevalent, more prevalent, in fact, in our data than, than rural uh, issues. Um, this is Rafikul's story in uh, Jessore, Bangladesh. <clears throat> and this illustrates how ill health can combine with old age to make prospering very difficult. And this is a frequent connection that we found in the research, the combination of old age and ill health, perhaps not surprisingly. And this was, for Rafikul, this was after a lifetime of struggling through agricultural wage laboring, leasing land, making a go of it, including providing dowry for, I think it was six of his sisters to marry. For me, this illustrates very clearly the need for an old age pension or some other kind of uh, support for, for older people. Um, barriers to healthcare. Low, insurance, low health insurance coverage is prevalent across our countries. And Rwanda is an exception to that, uh, which I'll discuss in a moment. The quality of health services is very variable, meaning that pre people, including poor people, often seek private health care, where they often get better treated too. I don't mean treated in a technical sense, but better treated as human beings. I think there's quite a lot of research on that, and I think there are now programs to try and improve the way that public health services uh, treat their patients. Um, this was illustrated by the case of Stella, uh, who uh, during the rainy season, um, when access to the public health facility, uh, sorry, I, I'm, I, I'm just talking about the third point, third bullet point now, the high opportunity costs or high user costs is another barrier to accessing health, and, and this is, this is uh, what Stella is illustrating. Uh, so during the rainy season, the roads became impassable. She couldn't get to the public health facility, so she used a nearby a private health facility. She was very lucky that her husband... Could, uh, could manage to pay for that. So in the absence of health insurance or in the absence of an accessible, free, quality health service, coping strategies vary. We have Mias in Cambodia, who draws down on savings, borrows from family, and takes a couple of loans. One of the findings on the financial inclusion side in this research, which is quite disturbing is that in, across many different contexts, people are taking loans to repay a loan. And you can see how this, this happens in this case. Then we had uh, Ridu in Ethiopia, who sells his ox in order to pay for treatment for his mentally ill daughter. And we have Dindo in the Philippines, who has stomach cancer and gets support, including care from his social network, care from his immediate nuclear family. But uh, the care that he can get and the Financial support that he can get is failing. His mother has had to stop work due to rheumatism. She was one of his carers and supporters. And his migrant siblings are not always able to pay for his treatment. So uh, he's, had to, um, he, he's had to stop going for his treatments on occasion because they haven't been able to support him financially. And there's another factor here, reliance on kin. I mean, we might think of this as a, a very positive aspect of uh, social capital, but it means that those relatives who are called on are not are, are themselves hampered in saving or in investing or paying for other things like education. So there are knock-on effects. Our um, analysis, we've tried to draw out some policy implications from uh, the, the analysis that we've made. And Firstly, there are different, I think it's important to stress that there are different pathways to reducing the impoverishment which ill health can cause. Uh, there's no magic bullet here, although we might want to discuss that later. Um, sorry, 
Yes, we've got here low-income Rwanda, where we've also studied poverty dynamics through mixed methods research, uh, has woken the world up to what can be accomplished by high rates of health insurance coverage. They have over 80% of the population covered in their na national health insurance scheme. Uh, they've made health insurance compulsory, and they use their pretty exceptional machinery of government to follow this up and make sure that people do actually enroll in health insurance. The Rwandan government has mechanisms to make people do things or persuade people do things, to do things. And we can discuss that as well. Uh, but it also subsidizes the premiums for the poorest people. We can discuss that as well, how well it works. And it has greatly improved the health service, including the referral system, which is absolutely critical if you want people to subscribe to a health insurance system. It makes it worth signing up. And in our data, uh, it's the only country other than Malawi where ill health does not feature as a major source of downward mobility in our collections of life stories. So for me, this was one of the most remarkable uh, findings um, in, in the research. And Tanzania and Kenya are aware of what Rwanda has been doing, and they are busy now working out what they can do. Meanwhile, Kenya has devolved health to its 47 counties, or a large part of uh, health, service, health service provision to its 47 counties, as part of the creation of one of the most devolved systems of government in, in developing countries. Some counties have made significant investment. One example is the development of uh, a con conditional cash transfer for poor expectant mothers and uh, greatly improved uh, maternal health services in Kakamega. Again, partly based on borrowing from Rwandan experience, but in response to very high levels of maternal mortality in, in that district, in that uh, county. However, because it's a devolved system, the experience has not been uniform across the counties. It's very much depended on the enthusiasms and the abilities and capacities of individual county governors, among other factors. Uh, Tanzania is trying to develop a unified health insurance system with cross-subsidization to make sure it's inclusive, having failed to develop adequately its earlier community-based version. Kenya is taking another approach, gradually including different groups in its na national hospital insurance fund, with the NHIF uh, waiting to get a budget at the moment, waiting to get a budget from the government to include the elderly as a first step. The elderly have all been registered, but the government, as of uh, late October when I was there, early November, um, hadn't yet handed over the money to the, uh, to the fund. So countries are moving in this direction. If health systems are really to be upgraded, this involves committing higher levels of public expenditure. Malawi, the other country where we didn't find uh, life stories indicating that ill health was a major source of impoverishment, has the highest level of per capita expenditure among our countries. And this, coupled with its well-trained health uh, cadres, much poached, sadly, by the UK, not least, may explain why ill health was not found to be a leading cause of impoverishment there, both in the quantitative evidence that we have and in the qualitative evidence. There have been, and I've been trying to dig further into this. Um, I don't know Malawi personally, so if anybody knows Malawi, maybe you have some answers that you can contribute. There seem to have been massive investments in mosquito control, and malaria is uh, accounts for or accounted for a couple of years ago 40% uh, of all hospitalization. Malaria treatment, I think, has also been a big focus, as well as uh, HIV uh, AIDS. However, you know, there are downsides. Uh, stunting incidence is very high, uh, and I think USAID has been focusing on this strongly in its programs. There's a very good uh, health sector strategic plan for the current period, uh, which also reviewed the previous health sector strategic plan um, and indicated that certain fundamentals like um, inadequate and volatile supply of medicines and healthcare financing being very volatile and sometimes inadequate were, you know, remain very strong problems. So it's not all sunshine as far as I can see in the health sector in Malawi by any means, but 
I think we do have a remarkable result there, which I'd like to try and find the explanation. Uh, we also um, found some pretty good evidence in Cambodia. The health equity funds there are another approach where government allows free access to health care for those with an ID poor card. So the government has a system of identifying the poorest people. They get a card. They can get access to free treatment, whereas others have to pay. Um, in some work supported by USAID, which is up on the screen, uh, different approaches to, this, uh, to the health equity funds have been tried. And what was found was that the broader set of intervention, the broader the set of interventions and inclusion, so if you could include more people other than those uh, in the system of health equity funds, perhaps on payment of a small premium, um, other than those uh, who were identified by the ID poor card, and if you could provide more and better quality services, this meant that there was greater usage of the public health services, also greater usage by those with the ID poor card, so that the poor actually made better use when these uh, wider services and better quality services um, were provided. So an another implication of this work is that um, perhaps the, the, uh, we, we need to have a broader focus. It's not just about curative medicine here, and I think for many years donors have been um, very much trying to encourage uh, developing country governments to focus on primary health care and preventive health. So, just uh, there's a few issues here chronic illnesses, alcoholism, reproductive health, and mental health problems, which are perhaps in at least some circumstances focused on less than they might be, given their importance in, uh, in determining uh, poverty outcomes. So our analyses in Bangladesh and Rwanda particularly have revealed that acquiring a disability, especially a severe one, can be enough to impoverish a household. It's, it's the one cause that we've found which is enough by itself to generate impoverishment. In general, other causes require a combination or a sequence to actually generate impoverishment for any length of time. But disability, a severe disability, is the one which uh, doesn't need to be accompanied by another shock. But chronic illnesses in our extensive, extensive qualitative work on disability in Bangladesh had the same effect, perhaps re reflecting low levels of treatment success in that area. We know from uh, research done over several countries that alcoholism can, have, uh, can also have extremely damaging effects with few interventions to, to address it. Reproductive health is incredibly important, as increasing dependency ratios is often associated with impoverishment or temporary escapes, and results vary widely across country in terms of maternal mortality and use of family planning services. Again, lots of scope for, for further work in those areas. How am I doing for time? Two more minutes. OK, and th in that case, I will cut to the last of these issues, which is mental health, which also deserves quite a substantial additional focus, but is highly problematic. Mental health is a high proportion, often over 10%, often more than that, of the burden of disease in many countries. And the Uganda story illustrates the rather dismal state of policy responses. There was a mental health and poverty project in 2008 uh, to 10. Uh, run from a uh, South African university, but working very closely uh, with the government and its mental health services. And this produced a policy, a draft policy, um, based on consultation. It was a good process. However, legislation was then delayed. Finally, in 2017, the ministry developed child and adolescent mental health guidelines. But the service remains grossly under-resourced. If we look generally across lower, certainly low-income countries and also lower middle-income countries, uh, we find that progress in mental health is being made through context-specific pilot projects, some of which get scaled up. Uh, there's Canada's Global Challenges Program, which you, if you go to the, if you do a Google search, comes up frequently. There's another program um, with the Wellcome Trust, but there's, there's very little out there as far as I can see, at least. Um, 
It's an area for a lot of innovation and much needed political commitment, it seems to me. A recent paper from ODI argued that mental health is an economic issue, with 56 million years of work lost annually to, the anxiety, and, to anxiety and depression across the 36 largest countries in the world. It's possible to have clear, measurable targets, for example, in WHO's current mental health strategy, to increase service, one of the targets there is to increase service coverage for severe mental disorders by 20%, which can be measured by the number and proportion of pers persons with uh, a severe mental disorder who received mental health care in the last year. There are increasing numbers of inexpensive solutions going under the heading of task sharing. This is where lay health workers, that is, health workers with no formal mental health accreditation, are trained to provide basic mental health support. Development programs are demonstrating that this is working to fill, to at least partially fill the treatment gap, though ideally this needs to happen alongside an increase in the number of trained mental health professionals. And finally, mental health programming can be tacked onto other programs. For example, there's a strong, in some countries, there's a strong incidence of suicide among farmers. Agricultural programs could attempt to tackle that issue. Uh, postnatal depression. Um, could be tackled in programs focused on newborn and uh, child health. On that note, and this is my last point, <laughs> we have argued uh, across this research that a port, port and I think uh, Vidya has already mentioned this, that the portfolio response, wherever and to the extent possible, is needed, as the, there are no magic bullet solutions to poverty applicable everywhere. In relation to enhancing health capacities as a way of achieving resilience, Critical links across policy and programming include, the example here, combining health insurance with other forms of social protection, uh, as in the example from Ethiopia, where uh, outcomes were much better for people who had access to both, rather than one or the other. Poverty-focused programming, which often has an economic core, can also acknowledge the major risks underlying impoverishment and temporary escapes and find ways of directly or indirectly addressing these in a sense, adding these to uh, the economic programs to avoid undermining the results which ec economic programming can achieve. So on the one hand, the programs are focused on achieving the positive, but without taking account of the, the risks that people, are face in, uh, that people face in developing those positive uh, outcomes. And in, in closing, I would just like to say that going forwards, uh, we were encouraged by USA to do this work on health, uh, we'd like, um, we think it's produced some interesting results and we've been able to draw out some interesting uh, policy implications. We would like to do uh, further sectoral or topical analysis on issues like education, on agriculture, on gender, and so on, migration, urbanization. So if anybody's interested in talking about those afterwards, please do come and talk to me. And the other Thing, looking to the future of this work, we'd like to uh, expand our work in more fragile and conflict-affected environments. And thank you very much. And I'm going to pass over for some immediate comments to, to Liv. Good morning, everyone. Is this okay? So thank you, Vidya and Andrew, for um, the, the great presentation. Uh, being a part of the, this process, um, it was really great to hear your perspectives and, and the synthesis of this massive project. Um, I really like how Vidya gave the overall context in terms of the general findings, and Andrew gave the more specific health-related findings. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of key takeaways, um, some reflections that I had related to this work. Um, I wanted to st first start out by talking about how resilience programs really started out um, as a in response to climate shocks. Um, and I think that through in the past years that there's really been more and more of a recognition that there needs to we need to have a wider lens um, to really look at different types of shocks that may affect individuals, households, and communities. With this, we need to understand the impact of those different types of shocks. Um, and how do we then really um, strengthen the resilience capacities to be able to improve well-being 
um, and coping strategies related to these different types of shocks. So if you came in um, and did the poll, we, did, we asked you to answer a poll of, in your work, what's the most prevalent shock that, that you're working with? And overall, of course, this is not representative, um, but most people chose climate shocks. Um, but there was a, a large number of you that work with health shocks, conflict, and less or so, but still um, people chose also price shocks as well as gender dispossession. So I think that that's really important and really shows that the wide variety of shocks that, that we're working with and that people are exposed to. And also I want to point out that they're co-occurring and also can have you know, the multiplier effect, which I think Andrew alluded to. The second point that I wanted to, to make um, was that I really like how that in this report and through the findings that, the, that we highlighted that different types of health-related shocks matter. So it's not just focused on chronic or acute health-related shocks or non-communicable disease, but this emphasis on mental health and alcoholism. There's going to be different resilience-related programs related to different types of shocks. There are going to be different barriers related to these different types of shocks. We know that mental health is a huge burden on many um, communities. Andrew really pointed out that, that out nicely. There's also stigma related to mental health problems, a lack of services. In many of these contexts, there are a lack of health professionals trained to be able to provide services. There are evidence-based treatments that are out there that can be integrated into resilience programs, but without them actually being adapted and for people being able to deliver them, then it's, it's, it's not really worth it. In addition, I also wanted to mention, um, as someone that, that's really um, focused in on shocks and the outcomes in terms of psychosocial functioning, that you know, if we're talking about shocks and how they impact individuals, households, communities, we also need to account for not only depression and anxiety, but post-trauma symptoms as well. And actually, what does that look like in these contexts? Because we can't base it on just Western conceptualizations of mental health and how people um, experience uh, shocks. So that kind of brings me to the third point, that context really matters. And I think one strength of this massive project that, that um, Andrew and Video kind of overtook was that using these mixed methods really allowed us to see differences across context. And the qualitative piece allowed us to um, really get an in-depth look that could inform the quantitative findings. So I think that that was really important. Um, and then this can inform programs and policies that are adapted to different contexts. At the same time, we can look to see what's working in certain contexts. So you talked about Rwanda and, and how that, that this wasn't this issue, and see what's working there and what can we take to apply in different contexts. Fourth, I think that it's important to, um, to look at this in, in terms of taking a holistic approach. So policies and programs really need to be across sectors and across uh, levels. So not just at the systems level, but really down, starting from the individual level, working itself up, and seeing how all of this is interrelated. And then finally, the, the key takeaway that I have in terms of, of hearing all of this and kind of putting it all together is how do we actually account for health-related shocks and integrate them in into our current resilience programming? I think that there are a lot of challenges, but I think that it can be done, and I think that we should start moving in this direction because it's, uh, the, the shocks, it's, it's clear that these health-related shocks really impact, impact households um, and the system as a whole. So with that, I will end, and we can take questions from here. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much to our speakers. Just testing and bringing up this mic. I know this one's a little not one of our um, best microphones. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you for the excellent presentations. We have about half an hour for questions. And so we'll take some from our in-person audience and our online audience. I'd like to try um, the method of taking two questions simultaneously, um, just to kind of get through as many as we can. And also feel free, you know, not just a question, but to share some concise comments if you um, have seen you know, strong relevance to your work or examples that might contribute to this discussion. So are there any in-person questions? I can just over to you. All right. And um, if you're willing, please state your name and organization as well. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jackie. I'm with AFSI Foundation. And I have a question mostly for Vidya. Um, you mentioned conversion factors. So I'd like to, if you could give us some examples of what those conversion factors uh, might be. Thank you. 
Great. And if we have one more in person, I can take that now too. David Hughes working for an organization called Evaluation Metrics. Um, that was a fascinating presentation and thank you very much. I'm, um, the, um, my question really relates to what is happening in the future because demographically we're going to see a doubling of populations in sub-Saharan Africa, in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And I wonder, you know, what is being done to address poverty amongst youth, you know, whereas health-wise they may not have major needs, but they definitely have education needs. And then the second piece is what is being done to preserve skills within these countries to be able to address the growth needs necessary. Um, you know, Andrew mentioned the, the loss of of skills from Malawi, but it's not just Malawi, it's happening all across the board. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Um, with regards to the conversion factors, so this really operates from the individual up to the systems level. So some examples includes um, adverse or beneficial social norms. So beneficial social norms then really enabling um, women-headed households, women as well with regards to um, increased mobility, increased um, over time, increased empowerment and so forth to really take advantage of their re um, resources and assets, both tangible in terms of land, but intangible in terms of education and so forth, to then um, work towards sustained escapes. Because it's one, it's one side of the coin to have these assets, but then making use of it um, in, this, in an enabling environment um, is quite critical. Other examples include the degree of proporous growth as well in the country. Um, so it really varies like, um, depending on the level you're looking at. Um, with regards to the futures work and poverty amongst youth, I'll let Andrew as well answer this in more detail, but um, real, what one key finding in our studies was really the importance of education across countries, but not just any education, it was particularly secondary education in sustaining poverty escapes. So. Here is where you see, yes, the importance of secondary education, but then also t in some countries like Kenya, um, there were a lot of risks or sometimes households misapplying resources to um, formal schooling wherein TVET or skills development might have provided better results. So that's also something to keep in mind. And relatedly, secondary education skills, but then also combining this with some level of empowerment as well. Um, so then the, the youth, the, um, the youth and uh, leaders of tomorrow can really make use of those skills. Um, yeah, Andrew. Thank you. Yes, uh, David, good, good question. Um, <clears throat> just building on what Vidya has said uh, and thinking about Kenya as, as one example. Um, in Kenya, uh, education has been valued very, very highly a very long time and as far as we could see it's still valued very highly um, and it may be that some of the academic education which is provided in in the schools is not quite what people need to escape poverty and, and stay out of poverty so I think there are issues about the content of education which need to be addressed another thing that we found there was that uh, and this applies elsewhere as well um, to some extent is that a huge amount of social capital is used up in getting kids through education. So uh, one individual might support, um, of course, their own children, but also their siblings uh, through school um, and possibly you know, the children of their brothers or sisters or, or whatever. Um, so a huge amount of social capital is used. Uh, and again, this means that uh, families are not able to save and invest uh, economically. And what we noticed uh, in the Kenyan data set very strongly was that when these obligations to see children through school had, be, had finished, that was the point at which the household might take off economically because they would have the resources to, to invest. So the Kenyan government has um, committed itself to providing free secondary education, uh, which I think would, you know, if implemented, it hasn't been implemented yet, but if implemented, uh, will hugely reduce the burden on 
families to support their kids through school. And I suppose that's the kind of, in a sense, fairly obvious uh, next steps in, in, in towards the future. Um, but on the skill side, uh, I think, uh, again, our research findings suggest that having a practical skill can be uh, much more important than having an academic education. Uh, often practical skills, you know, the, the, the system for acquiring practical skills is pretty creaky. The training and vocational education uh, system is, in many countries, not working well, very expensive, uh, and doesn't create good outcomes because often the private sector isn't involved in um, the governance of what happens or the, um, the content of, of syllabuses and so on. So what we found is that people are acquiring skills, but they acquire them informally, often through migration. Uh, and uh, I think Vidya mentioned that people will migrate, they'll acquire a skill along the way, they'll acquire some business acumen, and they'll come back and they'll make some investments uh, in the maturer part of their life and, and uh, contribute to um, their community's economic development like that. I mean, I think that in a number of countries now, there is a big push on TVET. So TVET has been very much the neglected part of the education system, but governments have woken up to this, and they are, they are really making a big push. And I think this is something that the international community can, can support very strongly. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to toss it back to our online audience for a couple of questions. Yeah, so we have a number of great questions, um, including several from Indra Klein, who wanted to know if trust of the health system, um, trust of the health system emerged in the qualitative work as a constraint to engaging with health insurance and services. Uh, did you say trust in the? Or Yes. Trust in the health system, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I think uh, implicitly, yes, because uh, people are skeptical about the results uh, of going to the public health system. And so they still choose to go to the to private practitioners. And um, so, yes, I think is the, the short answer to that. <laughs> Not universally, clearly, and I, I mentioned various situations in which the quality of health services have been significantly improved, and I think over time that's going to have an impact on, on people's trust in, in the system. All right. Um, all right. Any more questions from our in-person audience? I'll throw one over here. Thanks. Hi, David Chalmers with USAID. Thanks very much for the presentation. Very informative. Uh, comment in response to Andrew's question on what explains uh, recent health gains in Malawi and why that's not contributing to um, uh, poverty backsliding and, and uh, in the way it is in other countries, and then a question. Uh, the comment in brief, so I worked in Malawi for four years um, until recently, so have perhaps a little bit of insight into that, and while I'm a little biased, I think in this particular case, a lot of the answer actually has to do with USAID and other donors. <laughs> um, and that's not always the case. But in, in Malawi, it really is. You're talking about, by some measures, the poorest country in the world, uh, GDP per capita around $300. And while government's investing a relatively high portion of its own resources compared to other countries, it's still negligible compared to what the donors are putting in, um, which is well over 90% of the total response. You've had tremendous progress on HIV AIDS and malaria, um, but we're investing $80 million plus a year through PEPFAR, thanks in large part to our support. Malawi was the first country to really roll out option B plus um, nationwide, uh, allowing uh, HIV positive mothers to get on um, uh, ARVs uh, regardless of their uh, viral load. And um, similarly, in malaria, it's, it's just a, a massive response that's really making a difference. So I, I think that's probably where most uh, of the answer is. Similarly, with the recent El Nino-related crisis, you had almost half the country receiving food assistance, most of which was supported by us. And I think you would have seen a lot more health shocks, particularly related to uh, nutrition and food security, if it hadn't been uh, for that response. 
Um, in terms of training, I would question a little bit the, the notion that you have nationwide a, a well-trained health cadre. I think that's actually a huge challenge and ties in quite a bit to what you were highlighting on education and the importance of secondary education. So we're actually using a substantial amount of PEPFAR resources to invest in secondary education, which takes that further away from uh, health than you normally would, but it, it's exactly for that reason that secondary education is so critical to having folks with enough of a basic level of education to move up. Um, I think there's interesting things happening around pay for performance, but real sustainability challenges when you have such a high portion of the health budget coming externally. Um, and that's why I think the Feed the Future programming is so critical and the portfolio response um, USAID is working towards with, with other donors is such a critical piece of the solution. So just a couple of quick thoughts on that, um, having recently been there. The question is the, the recent research on uh, mental health and, and sort of aspirations and self-esteem you highlighted, I, I think is really interesting and really important and has been neglected for a long time. So um, the question essentially is, can you speak a little bit more about what that means programmatically? How can, how can USAID and other donors best address those issues as part of the type of portfolio response you've, you've highlighted is so important? Thanks. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead with one more question in person before you can address the mental health question. Here you go. Hi, my name is Julie Kurtz. I work at IFPRI. Um, my question is primarily for Lynn and somewhat related um, to your question. I'm, I'm looking more at the psychology. Um, you mentioned the, the stigma that is around certain health conditions around alcoholism. I was wondering about um, the sort of psychology of poverty and how much that relates more generally speaking and how much it may or may not differ regionally, geographically, um, poor communities that are in cities or have more exposure to extreme wealth compared to poor communities that um, may or may not be more content based on on their isolation or, or proximity to other communities. So, Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you, David, for the uh, comment on Malawi. That's uh, that's very useful. Um, yes, I mean, I think the donors are supporting the health services in a massive way. Um, and it's good, I mean, in a way, it's good that uh, the research came out the way it did. Um, it's having an impact, which um, is impressive. Um, you know, it wasn't something that we were looking for, in a sense. So it's, it's always, I mean, it's kind of, doubly valid in a way. Um, the question on mental health, uh, I can't give you a really good answer to that. Uh, I wish I could. But I think um, there's a couple of issues that I'd raise. One is what I mentioned uh, in the presentation, which is that mental health issues are often related to other aspects of development. This is not something which should be confined within the health sector in terms of responses. So I think that ha developing a broader awareness through poverty research or through uh, whatever other means are available of the impacts of mental ill health um, and the choices that there are in terms of how it can be addressed uh, would be the way to go, would be at least one way to go. So building uh, aspects of non-mental health programs in uh, building mental health into uh, as, uh, as aspects of, of non-mental health programs I think is is an important thing to to try to do um, I think the other thing is that it's a very difficult issue in the sense that it's culturally how mental health is handled culturally uh, is highly varied and very controversial and often difficult for uh, Westerners to comprehend or to sympathize with. Um, so uh, there are all sorts of elements of traditional medical practice which uh, Western practitioners would be very skeptical about. Um, there are aspects, there are human rights issues uh, for people suffering uh, mental health conditions. And I guess that um, 
some of the successful programs, the, the task sharing programs that I mentioned, incorporate traditional practitioners uh, and others from the local communities. Now, along the way to doing that, I guess you're going to have to make compromises. You're going to have to develop mutual understanding. Um, it's not going to be a straightforward process. And I think when you when you don't have um, clear policies or guidelines on how that can be done, it's a highly innovative process. But uh, it's it's something that um, again it's going to it's going to have to be done over the coming period. Thank you. Yes, thank you for both of those questions. Um, just kind of, kind to to um, piggyback on on what you were saying. I think that um, in terms of mental health programs and how do we actually do this, it needs to be adapted to the context and making sure that again that it's not based on Western conceptualizations of mental health, Western conceptualizations of what treatments will work. Although we don't want to throw out things that we do know that have worked in other contexts. Um, and so some of the work that I've done previously, some of the research has been adapting evidence-based treatments that have been developed here and have shown to be effective, and then adapting them in different contexts, so in Zambia and Uganda. That's not the, the end result, though, because you can, you, know, you can do an RCT and show like, oh, this was effective, and we showed that post-trauma symptoms were reduced or depression was reduced. However, um, it needs to be scaled up, and so working with ministries, having the buy-in, and building capacity within the country, because looking at the number of psychologists, number of psychiatrists, number of social workers within a lot of these contexts is, is little to none. Um, and so really being able to train lay health workers, which we've shown you can do, to, to, um, to adapt these, these programs um, is something that, that can be done as a start. It's not the end result, but, but I think kind of building up the capacity. I think it's an excellent question that you asked in terms of the psychology of poverty. I don't know how to actually answer that, um, but I would say yes, I think that there's an impact uh, on um, mental health problems, on functioning, um, on people's level of suffering in terms of being poor. Um, but I actually, I don't know of studies that have been done. I, I feel like I, I have more of a context of in, of the, in the United States. Um, but in different contexts, I, I don't know that answer. So, but that's that's a great question. And I think that research should be done because I think that, that that there could be definitely an influence. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll take a couple from our online audience and then come back to the in-person room. Great. Um, so we had a question from Raghunathan Narayanan. I hope I'm not slaughtering his name, um, but kind of otherwise put, um, the presenters talked a lot about the importance of holistic integrated solutions, but what sort of recommendations do they have for how to actually do this, given that so much programming is siloed? Oh, another one at the same time? Um, uh, from Nefer Faltas, um, in, in terms of the resilience impacts of disability, um, whether there were data on whose disability within a given household yielded the greatest negative impact, or was the disability question just simply yes or no, was someone in the household um, disabled? All right, thank you. Um, I'll address the disability question specifically. I mean, so in our work, there was oftentimes found to be a triple whammy, so to speak, wherein if you're a primary income earner or a major, in the, the key breadwinner or primary income earner in the household, firstly, your household loses income um, if you suffer a severe disability often. Sometimes this then is aggravated by others in the household who engage in care work and also then lose some, there's some opportunity costs of that care work as well that re um, results in reduced income for the household. Um, and then also, um, of course, the costs of treatment and so forth. So there's multiple aspects to this. So yes, if the primary income earner was affected, this um, tended to have more severe consequences. Um, with regards to, as well, who's disabled, I mean, so we've done a separate, Andrew alluded to this, we've done a separate deep dive into disability and poverty dy dynamics in rural Bangladesh. And here what we've seen in one of our studies is really when you compare 
even amongst chronically poor individuals, when you compare chronically poor women with disabilities, they consistently experience outcomes that are even considerably worse than chronically poor men with disabilities. So lower outcomes in terms of even receipt of social transfers, in terms of more vulnerable employment, across a range of indicators. So there's also this, again, here, a gender dimension to bear in mind. Um, yeah, on uh, developing integrated programs or holistic programs, uh, it's a really good question. Um, and I think the answer should be context specific because the capacity to integrate different dimensions uh, of development varies a lot from one country to another, possibly within countries from one locality to another, depending on how effective the government is, what kind of other agencies you have working uh, in a location, and how they relate to each other, and how you know, are there effective coordination mechanisms and so on. So I think the context varies a lot. Uh, it's often quite expensive to do holistic or integrated programming. So there are cost barriers. And this means that the integration or the, the degree of holistic work uh, which uh, you can undertake should be should be highly targeted, should be targeted at, at what is really essential. So there's been, I mean, there are some examples. I think you can, if you have a particular program, you can consciously aware of the risks that that program may not produce the outcomes that uh, you want it to, or aware of some of the synergies that could be produced if you expand your program into another area of work, related area of work. Um, so I think that's the kind of logic that I would want to promote. And examples of this would be uh, social protection systems, which are aware that if they are providing people with cash transfers, these cash transfers are going into accounts. Can you make a step to including uh, a financial inclusion component into your program? Now, it can be very difficult to do that, because financial inclusion and social protection have different rhythms and different requirements. But if you can get social protection uh, providers working with financial inclusion providers, you can achieve a synergy uh, for people on the ground. Uh, I think we've pointed out the way that the non-farm economy is neglected in policy making and quite often in programming as well. Uh, there are, by contrast, there are more agriculture-focused programs. But as we've seen in our research, Getting out of poverty and staying out of poverty is often a matter of diversifying your portfolio as a household. Uh, perhaps the agencies supporting agriculture could diversify their portfolios a little bit as well. So I think doing agriculture plus. People talk about social protection plus, social protection plus plus. What about agriculture plus? Probably happening here and there around your programs in, in USAID. Uh, but I think that would be, that would be a way to go. I think the other aspect of this is focusing on particular people or uh, households or um, communities and overlapping interventions. So just making sure that interventions which are produced by different agencies or which originate from different policies are having an impact in, uh, in those same communities or same households. Hey, thank you so much for those responses. Um, making sure my audio is coming through. Yeah. On, on that note, I wanted to put in a, um, a plug that, uh, on behalf of AgriLinks and Mar Mar MarketLinks, uh, we are always interested in hearing and receiving success stories um, or lessons learned, failure stories, if anyone's willing, um, about things like um, integrated programming and also on reflections on uh, what you hear in any of our seminars. So I just wanted to put an open invitation to anyone really in the development community. Uh, we do accept um, public submissions for blog posts and resources on these two websites. Um, so if you're interested, you can always submit things directly on the website itself, or if that's a little too confusing or you're not as tech savvy, you can always email um, me or Scott to submit your reflections or your resources to AgriLinks and MarketLinks. Um, let's see. All right, we have, yeah, maybe 
a few minutes left for a few more questions. So I see there's two in-person questions I'll get. I'll get one over here and one over here. Lisa Kingston from World Vision. I just wonder, um, this builds upon what we've been discussing, but do you think we're at a tipping point in terms of trauma-informed programs? Um, the reason I ask that is we tend to talk about alcoholism and there's a few other points, but the amount of sexual gender-based violence, the violence in general, um, and again, I'm suggesting I know that we should not be applying Western techniques or you know, activities necessarily Western focused, um, but what applies to that environment. But I mean, I guess my question is, and we can't answer this probably today, but how much of this is, is foundational to successes in communities? And, um, and do we think it's at a tipping point where we're going to see a, a shift in, in investment in this area? I know definitely in Kenya, we don't have the number of uh, mental health workers or um, other folks, just paraprofessionals in general. Um, and the private sector has stepped in at certain occasions, like the post-election violence. But um, definitely, I see this as potentially could change some things foundationally for the way we approach our programs, whether it's agriculture or in re any resilient programs. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my question builds off of the demographic shift question, and then also the comment that Andrew made about um, the urban-rural disparity, or health disparity. And so I was wondering if you can make some, uh, like, uh, expand on that a little bit more, and also comment on uh, what are some knowledge gaps or research opportunities with, uh, with respect to individual health system or uh, country level programming or policies um, in terms of resilience, health, um, health systems, and poverty, and particularly focusing on the urban poor. Okay, <laughs> I know you can. <laughs> can. Can I keep talking? Okay. Um, so um, I think that that's a great point, and, and yes, we, we do need to be very careful, which I've reiterated in terms of, of what our thoughts are in terms of how people are experiencing um, shocks and stresses. Um, but I will, um, as an example, um, there's, a, there's some work that, that colleagues of mine have done um, with the Applied Mental Health Research Group at Johns Hopkins University. And the methods that, that they have used, and I've done a lot of work with them, is to, to when they go into a context, to ask individuals using qualitative methods, um, what are some of the problems that, that people in your community experience? And how do they cope with those problems? And just ask them to list them. And so you're not going in with any preconceived notion of, do you have post-traumatic stress disorder? Or do you have symptoms of depression? Oftentimes, in some of the contexts, there's not a word for depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but what, what they have found, what we found in a number of different contexts, is that symptoms that look very similar, or psychosocial problems that look very similar to depression, anxiety, post-trauma um, post symptoms, emerge from those qualitative findings. Um, and so, and at the same time, alcohol use, substance abuse, are oftentimes co-occurring. And so I think that you are right that, that there is this tip and, tipping point in terms of when people are experiencing um, not only large-scale covariate shocks, but idiosyncratic, whether it's gender-based violence, someone that becomes sick in the home, um, uh, child abuse, all of those things like, are, can be co-occurring and can, um, can have an impact of some of these co-occurring issues. Um, and I have uh, colleagues that actually just wrote a paper in the, the Lancet that talks about how there's really been a gap in looking at co-occurring issues of mental health and substance use in low middle income contexts. Um, so I think that, that you're absolutely right. And so with that, we do need to really focus on trauma-informed care and integrate them in these different approaches. 
Is there a tipping point? Was was the question as well? Yeah. Do you think there is? Yes. Do yes. you? I mean, what, what do you mean? <laughs> I hope so, and 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 <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> what I see in the donor world is a huge focus on um, gender-based violence, and I think that's being translated into lots of programs in lots of different countries. I don't see the same happening with mental health more generally in the donor world. Yeah. Um, so I, in terms of mental health services um, and initiatives and so on, I, I don't see a tipping point. But maybe there are specific areas within that. Um, the, the other, I mean, I may be wrong about that. I hope I'm wrong, but... <laughs> well, you're, 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 talk, you're talking about the outcomes of gender-based violence. Yeah, so I mean, I know the National Institute of Health has, has there's growing support in mental health projects and different contexts that are not just U.S. based, um, but it's 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 hard to get funding. But I think that there is a growing recognition of what the outcomes of different types of shocks and stressors, different types of, of traumatic events that people are experiencing, which has got to be a good start. <laughs> but maybe the tipping point is some way down the line. Um, on the other question about the, the demographic shift and urban-rural differences, uh, I mean, the example that I gave from Niger, uh, I'm, to be honest, I'm not quite sure why uh, there is that disparity. Um, I had a quick consultation with Vidya, and she said, well, maybe it's because uh, urban health services are more overcrowded. Uh, it could be that in some cases, uh, governments have given more attention to rural health services and left... Uh, urban populations more to the private sector. Um, I think that's something we'll have to have to look into a little bit more. Do you want to add? Yeah. Also, I mean, from our fieldwork in Nepal, it was really interesting because one of the urban areas we explored was, I mean, we had to change our focus from that original urban specified area because there were a municipality which was classified as a town more recently, but really resembled a rural area, and they themselves were quite. Um, they were not appreciative of being classified more in the town um, city category because that resulted in um, a loss of uh, funds that they w could have otherwise accessed in the original um, specification. So that was, and they didn't even have, um, they didn't have really good access, really, they didn't have paved roads, um, better infrastructure to accompany that shift. So it was just in name. Um, due to proximity and these other factors so that they weren't too happy with that. So that's part. We, so it is related to the investments that might be accrued more to rural areas. Also, um, again, it is uh, based on some of our work as well in the urban areas that we've explored. It is there's a lot of over um, congestion um, as because the population densities as well are much higher there. So even though they might be more, they might or might not be more facilities. The, the quality and so on suffers be oftentimes because of that overcrowding. Um, Based on the knowledge gaps and research opportunities, I'll begin by answering this um, for the urban poor. I mean, one thing just to keep in mind, rather than answering it, is the various links that continue to be maintained between urban and rural areas. So there is um, seasonal migration. There's all these um, strong links in Niger. Most of most households did engage in um, some form of um, within country. A, l a lot of households engage in some form of within country migration. So going to um, uh, remaining in, during harvest time, but then going to towns um, during other times as well to complement household income. So that those links are quite important, I think, um, to expound on. Yeah, and uh, I would say that the um, the issue of urban poverty dynamics. So, you know, looking at people, understanding why people are upwardly mobile or become impoverished in an urban setting is something which uh, has not been focused on, including by ourselves, uh, partly because we've been very focused on extreme poverty, and there's much less extreme poverty in towns, at least 
by current measures, but there's a whole debate about the measurement of poverty in urban areas, which would suggest that you know poverty lines probably ought to be higher and so on. So, I mean, this is an area that this research has opened up, and I think there's scope for a lot more work on uh, on urban poverty and urban poverty dynamics and the reasons for um, uh, people's uh, well-being trajectories and so on in, in urban areas. Um, in terms of research gaps, Vidya uh, mentioned migration, and one of the issues that I keep coming back to, I mean, we find migration is such an important part of the story of escaping poverty sustainably in so many countries. And it's international migration, but it's also within country migration. And it's urban rural or it's rural rural. And it's all kinds of migration can play an important part. Um, we have some understanding of the processes. And there's a long tradition of research on migration. But when it comes to what governments can or should do, there's often a, an unresolved debate. Governments don't want to encourage migration. Even among the researchers that we work with, you know, if we talk about migrant support programs in Cambodia, for example, I was told that I shouldn't use the term supporting migration because this would not be uh, looked on favorably by, by government. Whereas, you know, migrants face lots of challenges and they leave people at home who face lots more challenges in many cases. So I think researching uh, what can support migrants in the process of migration ought to be an important uh, aspect of research on, on poverty reduction going forwards. And there's very little out there. Uh, another, another gap, related gap, is what kind of policy measures and uh, programmatic interventions support the informal sector, the urban informal sector, but also the, the rural non-farm economy that um, Vidya was talking about. We actually, there are a couple of ex really good examples. So the Chinese town and village enterprises, very good example, Latin American territorial development. But if you look around for other kind of strong success stories, strong models, they're either not there or they're not reported on. So I think a, a process of, of stronger searching for or experimentation on what works uh, in the informal sector would be very useful. Yeah. Sorry. Really quickly, one last point as well. Um, when Andrew was speaking about migration as well, in again in Nepal, what we saw and in the Philippines as well to some extent, um, in urban areas, women sometimes had lower mobility or lower freedom of mobility. So one of one quote from Nepal, I remember, it was just like, people will think badly of me if I go out here alone, was what a woman said. Um, so and oftentimes as well, when people do my, when women do migrate um, internationally and so on, for example, in Nepal and the Philippines, um, Nepal more so, domestically, um, to, to engage in domestic work, in international migration, there was this was often um, associated with some compromise of their dignity, sexuality, and so on. So then, when they returned home, they were actually they found it more hard to procure investments to start their own businesses and so on. So often had to re-migrate again under precarious conditions. So it was quite a vicious cycle there. Um, so it's important in as well in these migration cycles and supports to really incorporate this full life cycle and these gender dimensions once more. Thank you. All right, we are at time, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, please be on the lookout for the recording, transcript, and some other related resources in your inboxes in about a week's time if you want to share with your colleagues or review any of the content. And I would like to extend a sincere thank you to the large group of people who helped put this together, especially the Feed the Future KDAD project. And most importantly, I'd like to thank our audience for attending, for asking great questions, and for helping continue these webinars and webinars into the future. So thank you all.